welcome Catherine Lee. You are our first reader for the Esport Gallery's literary events of 2021. Catherine is a seventh generation Mainer who lives, writes, teaches, and flower gardens near the ocean in Eastport, Maine. She's been putting words on paper ever since she acquired written language at the age of six and does not remember a time when she was not telling herself stories, which is the legacy of parents who daily read to her when she was very young. Beginning in the 1980s, her short fiction has appeared in a variety of print and online journals in Maine and beyond. Much of her fiction is regional, concerning characters caught between traditional ways of life and the changing face of Maine's working coast. She is currently putting together a collection of these stories titled Island Secrets, Stories from the Gulf of Maine. And I can't wait for that to be done. Lee began writing haiku in 2007 and found immediate success publishing widely, winning numerous awards and being named an emerging voice in English language haiku in Red Moon Press's A New Resonance series. She won the 2010 Turtle Light Press Haiku Chapbook Competition for her collection, All That Remains, and was invited to edit the annual members anthology of the Haiku Society of America in 2015. In her free time, which amazes me that she's got any free time, she enjoys sewing, the art form Zen tangling, and playing the five string banjo and the banjo lele. And she's a DJ at Shed Radio here in Eastport with her own show. She's a photography enthusiast and she can frequently be seen chasing dramatic skies for shots she can use in creating haiga, an image plus haiku visual art form. So Catherine, welcome. And before you start reading for us, um, I was hoping that you could explain the difference between Haiku and Haiban for all of us. Well, Laura, thank you very much for inviting me today. I am honored to be the first one in the 2021 series of readings. Haiku is a Japanese short form. A lot of people associate haiku with 575 as far as syllable count goes, but in the English language, we don't really adhere to that. Uh, some people do write traditional haiku that way. I do not, so mine do not follow that form. Um, usually haiku includes a nature image and a seasonal reference, and it's in two parts, a one-line piece and a two-line piece that work together to illuminate each other. Now, haibun is a Japanese form that was styled by Basho, one of the four great haiku ancestors, and it consists of a prose piece that's linked to a haiku, but the haiku and the prose piece do not echo each other, but they resonate against each other, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing your haiku and your haiban, thank you. Thank you. I, ha I chose some haiku for you today. In haiku, we usually read things twice because they're so short and they go so fast that it's sometimes hard to catch them. So that's why I'm repeating myself here. It's, it's the traditional way we read. This hush before the coming of crows, winter dawn. This hush before the coming of crows, winter dawn. Seaside meadow, white waves of yarrow go on and on. Seaside meadow, white waves of yarrow go on and on. Overnight rain, the whole tree in a cupped leaf. Overnight rain, the whole tree in a cupped leaf. Ripple light, a wild salmon leaps above the rainbow. Rippled light, wild salmon leaps above the rainbow. Early frost, a wedge of wild geese crosses the day moon. Early frost, a wedge of wild geese crosses the day moon. Drifts of fog, beard lichen trembles in the dead spruce. Drifts of fog, beard lichen trembles in the dead spruce. Paper cranes, a yellow birch on pleats its leaves. 
paper cranes, the yellow birch unpleats its leaves. Deep silence, the sheen of dawn on crusted snow. Deep silence, the sheen of dawn on crusted snow. Vernal pool, a water strider skims the clouds. Vernal pool, a water strider skims the clouds. Noonday heat, the milkweed heavier by one monarch. Noonday heat, the milkweed heavier by one monarch. Clearing clouds, the rain barrel catches tints of sky. Clearing clouds, the rain barrel catches tints of sky. Full snow moon, the fox's shadow melding with the pines. Full snow moon, the fox's shadow melding with the pines. Winding road, the meadow dizzy with Queen Anne's lace. Winding road, the meadow dizzy with Queen Anne's lace. Morning hush. The fisherman casts a thread of sunlight. Morning hush. The fisherman casts a thread of sunlight. Evening stillness. The fog creeps in pine by pine. Evening stillness. The fog creeps in pine by pine. Meadow pond. Our blades slice figures on the moon. Meadow pond. Our blades slice figures on the moon. A train's whistle bending into silence, winter dusk. A train's whistle bending into silence, winter dusk. I have some high bone. Most of my high bone are childhood memories or memories from when I was young. I don't write an awful lot about current times. So if this sounds like an old person talking about the good old days, it's kind of what it is. The, the first two are memories of my family reunion, which um, used to take place up in Sherman, Maine, which is where my father's family's from. And uh, there was a grove and we would have this three day family reunion every Labor Day weekend. So these first two are about that. And the first one is called Roughing It. It was my grandparents who ruined camping for me. Or maybe they ruined me for camping. Or maybe both. Our family reunion was held each Labor Day weekend in a hardwood grove that bore our surname. My parents and I stayed at a cousin's farmhouse, but many, including my grandparents, tented on site. Grampy and Grammy's big green army tent was outfitted with their bed from home, a chest of drawers, and an antique iron stone commode set, bowl, pitcher, soap dish, and slop jar for washing up. I thought that was how everyone camped. Going to Girl Scout camp for the first and only time, I was appalled to discover that we'd be sleeping on the ground. On the ground! One night of that was enough for me. Campfire ghost stories, the long dark walk to the outhouse. And the second one is called From the Embers. For the three days of family reunion, it was our evening gathering place. On all four sides of the campfire, stump and plank benches offered seating for those who didn't turn in early. The burning wood crackled as it gave up the last of the sap. Sparks spiraled upwards in the dark and the talk went on. They were excellent storytellers, my grandfather and his two brothers. I can see them yet in their buffalo check wool shirts and felt fedoras, regaling us with family lore or weaving tall tales for our amusement. So much is lost in words heard but never written down. It's those stories, especially the pieces of family history that I wish had been preserved. But they're all gone now vanished like those sparks rising up only to fade into the darkness. Sickle moon, tracing the path back to where I belong. The third one is called More Than Male. 
Her name was Rex IV, but everyone called her the mailboat. Six days a week, unless the gale warning flags were flying, she plied the mail route running among the Fundy, Fundy Islands. Both we teens and our elders enjoyed day tripping aboard her to St. Andrews, a summer resort on the Canadian mainland where we'd have a few hours to sightsee and souvenir shop and eat lunch in a diner frequented by locals, not the summer trade. The real attraction for me though was the boat ride, the sun hammering the sea with light and a salt breeze to cool us. Our children and grandchildren never knew those simple pleasures aboard the mail boat. She was long ago abandoned, beached, on a, beached in an island cove, still majestic despite her peeling paint and weathering varnish. Like those of my generation who enjoyed these summer excursions, she is showing her age, but the cargo of memories she carried, we carry still. Tumble down wharf, all the mackerel we used to catch there. twisting the night away. It's the perfect kickoff to a neighboring town's bicentennial, a barn dance complete with square dancing to a live band and an old time caller. Afterwards, my mind flashes back to another kind of barn dance when I was a teenager. In the loft of a big old storage barn, most of the kids on the island paid 25 cents each to congregate while a suitcase turntable played the hot 45s of the early to mid 1960s. We danced every Friday and Saturday evening all summer long. The twist, the shag, the pony, the locomotion, the mashed potato, and yes, the occasional slow dance that allowed us to cuddle up, but not too much. We loved to dance. It was our weekend pastime and also our social capital dance or be considered hopelessly square. We felt bad for those who wouldn't dance, who never let the music carry them away. These days, I feel sad for the young people sitting at home, meeting virtually instead of face to face and heart to heart. Some of my students tell me that dancing is stupid. Others say it will make them look stupid if they try. As I reflect on tonight's barn dance, I realized that almost everyone there was of my generation. And old and creaky as we are, we're still dancing. Fiddle music on the dark pond, swinging stars. This last one is from the other side of my family uh, down in Somerset County. Summer flight. It's the smell that brings it all back that sweet dry scent of grass and clover rising from the knee deep hay. Unc could have pitched all that loose hay down on the floor of the barn and fed it to the cows, but he never did. He wouldn't take away one of our favorite pastimes. We cousins had our ritual, climb the wooden wall ladder to the loft, scuff through the hay the way we did through deep autumn leaves, mount the stacked bales to one of the massive Cross, piece, cross beams 10 feet high, walk with arms outstretched to its midpoint. Then one by one, jump, falling through the dust dancing sunbeams shining around the loading door, land in the warm, soft, but prickly hay. Do it again and again and again and again. And years later, wonder how we ever had the nerve. Pasture breeze, the littlest pony snorts out a fly. Okay, I have to ask, how was the mashed potato dance done? <laughs> well, you kind of um, pivot on one foot and then the other, it's on the ball of your foot. So you're so sort of mashing the yeah, it's supposed to kind of look like one of those hand mixer beaters going round and round in opposite directions. So you kind of pivot to the outside <laughs> and put in the other. I love it. That's wonderful. I'm going to have to try that. <laughs> so next you're going to be reading for us a prose poem and then a short story. And 
again, I was wondering if you could talk just briefly about those two formats and how how they're different for you in terms of how you use them to express yourself. I have more or less always written what I would call traditional fiction, short stories, a story arc, um, what we all read tons of in school and what every reader continues to, to probably read. The prose poem is a little different. I mean, it, it's a narrative. It can be a narrative, mine are, but there's much more emphasis on the language. It's really about creating the language as well as the narrative or even instead of the narrative. For me, that, that's what it is. So once in a while, I'll see something and I'll get this idea and I write one. It's not a form I do a lot. Okay, yeah, I was wondering about that. If it, yeah. was, if it was something that was uh, less used by you than the other forms. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, all right, let's, let's hear it. This is called In the Night Garden. And I will say just as a little bit of context, I wrote this during the Iraq war when there was a lot of desert warfare. In the night garden, from beyond the ghostly birches with foxgloves and lilies of the valley nodding at their feet comes the crisp taffeta rustle of the incoming tide. Among the dark mysterious foliage, white stars of night blooming flowers glimmer in the cold light of the gibbous moon. The air is warm on bare skin, sweet with the fragrance of moonflowers and Nicotiana tangy with salt. How many times did she find him here, standing in the white gazebo, looking out to sea? Now he observes a different landscape, a barren sea of sand, and the dangers are no longer only the dangers of love. In a country not his own, he serves and waits. And in the garden they together built from barren soil, she too waits. Here, all that fades and dies will return in spring. There in the desert where little blooms, there is no such certainty. Leaving Wapakwan, none of them realize it. In truth, I am just realizing it myself. Now that the boys have brought the Adirondack chairs and my ancient green wicker chaise long down to the dock for an unobstructed view of the sunset. They, my boys, Clarence and Polly, and their wives, I no doubt seeing this evening, this ritual, as simply one in a long chain of last summer evenings here at the lake, but I know better. They will continue to come to this main lake house as Carmichael's have for three generations. They are, after all, only in their 60s. But I turned 88 last month, and every year, both the trip to Lake Wapakwan and my rambles around the woods and fields and shore become more difficult. Gloria, Clarence's wife, arranges the chair cushions for me. I sit and Polly grasps my ankles and lifts my feet, even though I don't need help. I am, as everyone likes to tell me, very healthy for my age. Or oh, my age, what a qualifier. The younger generations, my grandchildren and their children, have already gone back to Boston and New Haven and Atlanta. It is just the five of us now, the boys and their wives and me, and we are all long past needing to fill every silence with idle chatter. Stuffed to the gills with grilled ribeyes and fire roasted potatoes and buttery corn on the cob and the blueberry cobbler for which Gloria is justly famous with the MIT English department, we sit with our separate end of summer thoughts. I lean back against the chair cushions and try to quiet my mind. The sinking sun is sending long rosy rays through the dark spruces above Roark's Point, rays that lie in near geometric straightness on the lake's glassy surface now that the breeze has died. A pair of bald eagles break free of the trees, sailing in widening circles against the apricot sky and lavender puffs of cloud. At the far end of the lake, a loon's eerie laugh rises. I try to take in every detail. I need to. I must not forget any of it. Not since Paris have I had a summer without these sunsets. I've just closed my eyes to fix it all in memory when Joyce, Polly's wife, 
breaks our companionable silence. How many summons have you come here, Mama Giselle? My eyes fly open. Stephen and I liked Joyce immediately when Polly brought her home. It would be hard not to be charmed by her Savannah Bell manners and warmth. Less charming is her disconcerting way of verbalizing other people's thoughts. Longer than we've been alive, Clarence runs a hand through his white blonde hair, a youthful habit he should have broken years ago. What, 65? 66, I say, 66 summers. Memory's door to past summers is opening, exactly what I've been trying to avoid. I seek a distraction, a change of subject. Listen. Youthful voices are raised in argument about borrowing a neighbor's canoe. We listen. Polly says it's so weird how you can hear conversations from clear across the lake, but not from next door. It's an acoustic geographic anomaly. We all look at Clarence, wondering where that came from. Polly laughs. Don't try to sound like your scientific buddies. My papers are stuck together. You're an English prof, remember? Joyce slaps Polly on the knee. Be nice. Gloria says, it's like the old party lines on the telephone. No secrets. That gets me thinking about the past again. The conversations that float on this ancient lake, the arguments that lie like shoals beneath it. Does everything circle endlessly back? Time feels fragile now, as though the membrane between the past and the present has worn thin. Could I slip through it and hear a Passamaquoddy mother crooning a lullaby or telling her children the legends of Glooscat? or see an early settler woman pegging the wash to the line? Could I reach through time and grasp the sticky hands of my tanned and sun-bleached young boys eating watermelon on this very dock? Or slide into the smooth linen sheets where my naked husband waits for me to finish brushing my hair? Stephen, oh, Stephen. I sit silent, trapped in my memories. Stephen showing me all his childhood haunts making love in the tall grass with daisies and red clover waving around us. Clarence and Polly, teenagers with their first sailboat. Clarence and Gloria's first born water baby, Teddy, learning to swim before he could even walk. All my grandchildren, Teddy and Alex, PJ and Poppy and Lulu, and their children, all part of this summer place. These summer memories. I am 88 years old and life has been a wonder. The sun has dipped behind the hill now, leaving only a faint golden glow through the trees. Indigo is creeping down the sky, smudging the tops of the clouds with charcoal. I close my eyes and breathe deep. The scent of lake water and piney woods, the aroma of summer. I had planned to tell Clarence and Gloria my decision during tomorrow's trip back to Boston but suddenly, it seems better to say it once to all of them. I'm not coming back next summer. It's too. My voice fails me. I feel on the verge of tears. And now I'm wondering why I thought I could live without Wapak Juan Summers. For what seems like a long, long time, no one speaks. Then Joyce says, you might could feel different when next summer comes. Or I might be dead or in a nursing home, no guarantees. Polly says, don't talk like that, mama. Clarence said, it won't be summer without you. Joyce swirls what's left of her lemonade. It's been hard enough without Papa Stephen. Don't, I tell her, don't talk about Stephen. Darkness is falling fast now. Behind us, an owl hoots softly. A Cheshire cat smile of a moon rocks on the pale wisp of cloud. Tomorrow at this time, I'll be home in Back Bay. This blanket of shimmering stars will be a faded remnant, only the brightest able to compete with the city's streetlights and headlights. Like memories, only those of greatest magnitude persist. I slip my arms into the sleeves of the cardigan draped about my shoulders. Gloria asks, are you cold, Mama Giselle? Do you want to go in? I lean on her arm going up the stairs from the dock. 
and again up the stairs to the second floor of the house. Go back out, I tell her, I'll be fine. My bedroom overlooking the lake, the master bedroom the boys have insisted I keep, has gathered the heat of the day. In my nightgown and robe, I open one of the tall windows and sit in the Boston rocker, where eons ago I nursed and sang to my boys. As I rock, I realize I can hear them talking on the dock. So sad, Gloria was saying. You're right, Joyce, it hasn't been the same without Papa Stephen. And without either of them, I can't imagine it. If only she could have stopped him, says Joyce. No, Clarence tells her. There was no stopping Papa once he made up his mind. Polly says that's the truth. Drowning, Joyce's voice again. So avoidable, so awful. If only we could have forbidden him to go swimming. Like forbidding a dog to wag its tail, Clarence says. I hear the quaver in his voice and feel it in my heart. Better a stuffy room than this conversation on the rising breeze. I close the window and get into bed. I wake early thinking about Stephen. I am the only one who knows. They think they know, but they don't. I have considered telling Clarence, but always stopped short of it. He doesn't need the questions that would nag him. Doesn't need to wonder if there was something he could have done. There wasn't. Stephen didn't drown because he couldn't swim as far as Roark's point. He could. He didn't drown because exertion brought on a heart attack or a stroke. It didn't. Stephen drowned because he had decided it was his time to go. He had chosen not to have the surgery, the chemo, the radiation, all those things that prolong the life, but not the living. He knew the cancer was in his lung and brain. Of course he chose to leave on his own terms. That was Stephen. The morning he came out on the porch in his baggy swim trunks, I understood what lay ahead. Everyone else was at the Blueberry Festival. We were alone. He held me for a long time. I tried not to weep, but I could feel the film of tears sliding between my cheek and the curve of his neck. I love you, he said. I will always love you. Then he tottered slowly down the dock and slipped into the lake. He was going to swim to Roark's Point and then as far around the lake as the strength and breath would carry him. I wanted to watch until he was out of sight, but that went against the plan. Instead, I lay on our bed for the agreed upon half hour, wondering if there were any chance he'd change his mind. He didn't, of course. I was calmer than I believed I could be when I made the calls to 911 and then to Clarence's cell phone. Calm when our boys in the ambulance and the state police divers arrived. Still calm when at last the undertaker came to take Stephen's body away. It's what he wanted, I kept telling myself. Like nearly everything else in his life, it went according to plan. This last morning, no one is up yet except me. I pad down the stairs in robe and slippers, pour a glass of tomato juice, and step outside. The rising sun forms a golden mist above the lake, and birds I've never learned the names of are calling from the trees. Monarchs flit among the milkweed beside the well house. I cannot bear to think I'll never feel this peace again. Stephen, I say, and he is here. He is always here in a way he never is in Boston. I go back into the house and slowly, quietly up the stairs. I find my old bathing suit and put it on, then go down to the dock and swim to the float. I try to measure the distance to Roark's point. It is not far, but I am no longer a strong swimmer. The sun is full up now. It's hot on my back and shoulders as I sit dangling my feet in the water. I feel them calling me, Stephen and Lake Wapatquan. I slide into the water and start to swim. I feel like we should have a little pause there for just absorbing that one. When you, when you write a short story like that, do you think about 
the next story that you never write that's connected to what you just wrote. I'm thinking about the characters there and Giselle's decision to do what Stephen did as her own decision though, not Stephen's decision. And it sounds like from what, how you describe her that she really hadn't done that before. The way that, way that you're describing Stephen is always uh, doing what he wants to do, making his decisions very clearly. And then she decides to. And I'm wondering if you, if you think about the repercussions of that, what the next story would be like. I usually don't know. Um, I generally don't know how something's going to end when I begin. If I'm writing something really long, like I've done the Nano NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Project three times, and to do something of that length, you have to plan. But when I write a short story, I get the start and I just follow it. I have no idea where it's going. So when I get to the end, I, I recognize it's the end and I don't really ever extend beyond that. Yeah, no, it's, that's very interesting. I, I love hearing about other artists and their process. It's, it's fascinating to me. Um, so I also was, fascinated by your heritage as a seventh generation Mainer, uh, because it's becoming rarer and rarer to find people who are connected to land, family, and place for that long. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how that influences your writing, your creative work. I feel very connected to place. And I, th I think place is a really important thing to me in my writing and in my life. Um, the tag regional writer is kind of a slur and I have never understood why, because I think the ability to evoke a particular place and time, if, if one likes to dabble into the historical aspect of fiction, I, I think, that, I feel like that's a gift to me that I'm able to experience the world that way, but place is very important. I am very interested in my genealogy. On the other side of my family, I'm also a double Salem witch descendant. Um, so that's something that, that's interested me. But in this particular side of my family, my father's side, um, my immigrant ancestor in 1650 was one of the Dunbar prisoners after the Battle of Dunbar between the English and the Scots. The Scots, of course, lost and were taken into a prisoner of war status, and many of them were sent here as indentured servants. Wow, that's a fascinating, really fascinating history. Yeah. One thing that's interesting is my next door neighbors growing up. One of them is also very much into, into genealogy. He is also a descendant of the Dunbar prisoners. <sighs> wow. which is, that's how I found out about the Dunbar aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you find that you, I, I mean, obviously in some of these, I could see family, family history, um, but do you find that your connection with place and your family history affects, influences your haiku in ways that are much, much subtler? It pro they probably do. And it's probably so subtle that I'm not really aware of it. Yeah. 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 I, I, from my perspective, reading your haiku, um, I could see it. Uh, that intense observation of place as if, as if all your ancestors are behind you with your observations, um, that they're all looking through your eyes at place because you're picking up details that so many of us just uh, see it but don't really absorb it. Like I'm thinking about the milkweed, one heavier, you know, heavier by one monarch with such a gorgeous, rich description of something that we just, tend to say, oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's what I think does. It forces you to focus on the very small details, which I think I'm, I'm very detail oriented anyway, but I think that's one thing I like about it is it is it really brings the nature in close without that filter of someone seeing it and someone saying, oh, look at this, this is really beautiful. It's It just is it presents you the image unfiltered. Yeah. But it's interesting you say that because, of course, my um, now I feel like I've <laughs> I'm totally unaware of my own process um, because my collection that was published by Turtle Eye Press, All That Remains, was really the whole thing was really 
following a family, kind of a family trajectory. Um, various little bits of various people and stories I've heard and everything. So yeah, I think that is, but I think when I, in, in the process of composition, I'm not even vaguely thinking about any of that. Yeah. And are, are you, which, which form do you write the most of, do you think? Um, I've written more haiku than anything else, but because they're so short, if you, I, I've, over the course of my life, if you went by absolute wordage, I have written much more fiction. And in terms of your short story collection, do you have any thoughts on when you might get done with that? I've got one story that I've been wrestling with for a very long time and I, I've workshopped it and people have said, oh yeah, I think that's good. And I'm like, there's something about the ending that I just don't feel I've got it, but I can't get any closer to it. And I may just have to say, okay, a couple of people I have tremendous respect for have said, no, I think this works. So I maybe should just trust them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, Catherine, this has been really lovely, and I so appreciate your sharing your writing with us by reading. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I really appreciate being asked. I am very honored and humbled by this, so thank you. Thank you.